I am Jessica Denson. I'm the Director of Communications for Connected Nation. Our focus as a national nonprofit is to identify innovative solutions to expand the access and adoption and use of high-speed internet and its related technologies. As you can imagine, telehealth is at the intersection of this and is a big part of our lives right now with, given the pandemic. This is our third webinar in a series of five that's focused specifically on past, current, and emerging use of telemedicine. These discussions come on the hills of a telehealth study released by our state program, Connected Nation Michigan, which has been in, in the works for years and years. That program has been working across Michigan for a long time. That study looked at the challenges and opportunities in telemedicine within rural counties, specifically five rural counties. It was released just a week or two before pandemic closures began happening. You can imagine telehealth began ramping up at a rampant rate as we were all asked to practice social distancing and rethink if we really needed to go to the doctor to be treated. Today, we're talking with two experts in the field of telehealth and telemedicine, one in research, the other with the healthcare system. I'd like to welcome Nick Sarantis, who is the System Director of Digital Health for Baptist Health, located in Louisville, Kentucky, and Dr. Bree Holtz, who is the Director of the Health and Risk Communication Master's Program at Michigan State University. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's my little introduction spiel. <laughs> Before we get things underway, I'd like to share a little bit of background on both of you so that our audience understands your areas of expertise in telemedicine, um, which there are very two different areas, but they do are two different sides of the same coin, really. So I'm going to begin with you, Dr. Holtz. She is an associate professor in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations and the Director of the Health and Risk Communication Master's Program in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences at Michigan State University. Dr. Holtz received her master's degree from the London School of Economics, her PhD from, the Michigan, from Michigan State University, and completed her postdoc at the Ann Arbor Veteran Affairs Health System in the Department of Health Services Research and Development Service. Her research sits at the intersection of information communication technologies, health, and interpersonal communication. Dr. Holtz has been studying telemedicine for just over 15 years, specifically examining the adoption and utilization of these services by providers, patients, and their informal caregivers. She also studies mobile phones in health, also called mHealth, and the effectiveness of electronic medical records and communication. Now, meanwhile, Nick Sarantis, who is our other guest today, is the System Director of Digital Health for Baptist Health. Again, that's located in Louisville, Kentucky, or the area of Louisville, Kentucky. He began his 10-year career with Baptist as an athletic trainer before transitioning to the Director of Sports Medicine for Baptist Health, overseeing sports medicine outreach, partnerships, and athletic training. Nick earned a Bachelor of Science in Sports Administration from the University of Louisville, where he was captain of the men's soccer team, and a Master of Science in Kinesiology with a concentration in athletic training at the University of Arkansas. In 2019, he moved to his current role as System Director of Digital Health, where he is responsible for implementing Baptist Health Strategic Vision for Digital Health programs, which you can imagine are extremely important right now. He also works at identifying new technologies and finding new expansion opportunities. In addition, he works closely, closely with both IT and planning to determine and develop new innovative services that meet patient needs and expand access to care. Both of them, both Dr. Holtz and Nick, have very they have a varied background and an important background for this time in our history, especially given with the pandemic and all that we need with telehealth. So now that we have a little background on each of you, let's get this started. This is an open discussion, so I would like to encourage our audience to send in questions because we understand that some of this is um, maybe new to some of you or maybe you've experienced or used telehealth and telemedicine, but you have questions about what's next, um, what may be going on, what you should know. Um, I encourage you to uh, leverage the, uh, Dr. Holtz and Nick's expertise and send us your questions. Um, having said that, I do have some questions prepared so that we can move the discussion along. And I'm going to begin with you, Dr. Holtz. Uh, studying telehealth for 15 years, you recently did a study that looked at patient perceptions of telemedicine visits before and after the pandemic or during the pandemic 
pandemic since we really are still in it. Can you give us a summary of what you did in that study and what you found? Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so, you know, because my background is in telehealth and I was interested in this uh, really unique time period and I think a, where we just all moved for our health visits to telehealth. And so the paper uh, examined the perceptions of those who have used telehealth uh, before uh, the pandemic and comparing those to people who have used them um, um, during. Uh, so I'm saying prior users and maybe current users to separate those. Uh, I ran through uh, the study, it was open March 31st through April 20th. So um, really giving, hitting I think that sweet spot of like this is kind of new for everyone. Uh, I had a total of 1,000 participants, um, just over 400 had used telemedicine. And then so I split up that um, 430, 434 people. And 264 people had used it prior and 170 had used it after for the first time. I think some really encouraging results came out in for telemedicine is that everyone was really satisfied. Like most people were um, either satisfied or very satisfied with the services. I think the interesting parts came um, in these different perceptions. So they would use the perceptions of quality of in-care. Um, so prior users, so people who'd used it before the pandemic were not as worried about the quality of care. I think that makes sense because they were seeking that out. You know, maybe people didn't use telehealth before because they were worried about the quality of care. So there was um, a difference in perceptions there. There was a difference in perceptions of continuity of care. And something I'd like to explore a little further is that the new users weren't worried about the continuity of care. They were also more likely to have a primary care provider and in my experience in understanding all antidotal on this, but I think that the new users were actually seeing their primary care provider. They were getting their telehealth visit through that. So they weren't worried about the continuity of care. Of course, like their doctor would know what happened in telemedicine because it was their doctor. So I broke it down um, 50, the age, uh, 15 plus 30 to 49 and 18 to 29. And I didn't, I had uh, 64 people who were in that younger group. So I'm just, I don't think I'm gonna talk about them quite as much. So it was um, pretty uh, around um, 96 plus percent had heard of telemedicine and actually the people over 50, 97.8. Um, so almost 98% had been aware of telemedicine before I gave that definition. So I think that's really interesting. And actually the, the most young group um, only had quite a bit less. Um, have you used telemedicine? Um, so of this, so just have you used telemedicine any, at any time before over 50, about 36% uh, had used telemedicine and the 30 to 49, 45.6% uh, had used telemedicine in the past. And that was really the big significant um, difference in there is just that that um, middle age group had used telemedicine more. And then the first time that they used telemedicine, um, so we had of the people who had used telemedicine, we had 49 people who had used it before the December, and then 33 after, and the, again, the 50 plus and older, and then 30 through 49, um, it was kind of evenly split there. The thing that I think is really um, a key driver uh, are these last two data points. And I think we're gonna see more telemedicine to be requested by patients, which I really believe to be that huge paradigm shift in like consumers wanting to use it. If it's covered by insurance, they wanna use it. They like it and they are going to use it. So here we can see that, um, you know, almost 77%, those 50 and plus are gonna use it in the future. Um, 30 to 49, 81% of them are gonna use it in the future. We have some unsures obviously there. And you know, these pandemics and it makes me, I don't know, you know, cause this has not been a good time for anybody, but just I think the more that we keep going, I think um, pandemics like this are hopefully not gonna become common common, but we'll like have to shut down to stop these things from going. So does a pandemic like this make you more likely to use telemedicine? And um, I, 
the answers are yes. And what I did check too, I don't have a slide for it, but the, um, the more satisfied they are with it, the more likely they are going to use it in the future. And I think again, it was a one through five scale. One was very satisfied. We were at like 1.5 for satisfaction. So again, most people were very satisfied or satisfied um, using telemedicine. And because of that, I think there's just gonna be continued use as long as we can make sure that the payers and the policies keep up, keep up with us. So Dr. Holtz, these two sets of numbers, do they, are they looking at um, just as the pandemic began and then uh, uh, six weeks later, is that what it is? Or no, is, this, so I, is this all done throughout? This was just done in a one shot survey. So are you likely to use telemedicine in the future was one question. And mm -hmm. then does uh, COVID-19 make you more likely to use? So I tried to separate or think about them um, like, does this pandemic make you want to use it? And then even if you weren't in a pandemic, are you likely to use in the future? And try to kind of see that separation there. Understand. Uh, I'm just struck, um, and Nick, maybe you have some comment on this since you are in the healthcare system right now. I'm struck that uh, a lot of people were already likely to use it in the future, um, and even more so with COVID, obviously, but there's not a massive difference between the two. Were, was there really a shift in, in thought process already that people were trying to use telemedicine and leverage it even before this began? So from my perspective, it was it was kind of one of those talked about a lot. Um, you know, I think it was out there. People had heard the words. Maybe they weren't even sure what the words meant in terms of telehealth versus telemedicine and all those different kind of things. But certainly it was gaining momentum. CMS was talking about it. You know, people were advocating for more. So it was out there. And I think just overall consumers, just a course of all of their lives are becoming, you know, more research driven and, and are researching things more and are looking for convenience. So I think it was just starting to come out there a little bit, but in terms of, you know, it was kind of chicken or the egg to a certain extent. Were providers offering it? Were patients asking for it? No one was, you know, I think it, it kind of, no one was necessarily talking about it together with their provider health system, but certainly um, there were some direct to consumer companies out there that were offering, you know, virtual urgent care services and things like that. So it was starting to get out there a little bit, but, um, but kind of just, just still a little bit under the radar in terms of just kind of mainstream. Now telehealth is something a lot of us have heard <laughs> that term <Yeah>. now. <laughs> so uh, you have, you have another slide, I believe, Bree, right? If yeah. you want to continue. Great. Um, just some interesting notes, I thought. Uh, so no matter the age, most they all reported having the same number of devices. So it was three to four were the most popular um, devices that connected to the internet. Um, individuals age 50 or plus are, were more likely to have a primary health care provider. I don't think that's very um, surprising. But looking at the larger data, uh, the newer users, so those who use telemedicine uh, after 2020, we're likely to have that PCP again, which is how I'm trying to, I mean, I don't have conclusive data on that, but I think that they were seeing their actual PCP in there. Um, and as I mentioned, like all groups were equally satisfied with telemedicine. And that I think is, is gonna be, again, just that huge consumer push um, in asking for it and having the services available to the, to the people who want it. Um, we do have one question from an audience member, um, Colleen Acker. She's asking, are these numbers national or apply only to Mi Michigan? So this was a convenient sample. So to be honest, most of my sample was in Michigan. And I also um, have a huge, um, but they were national. Um, it made it through. And I so I think I have at least one person in 48 states represented. Um, there's also a large group in California that is represented in this sample. But that is one of the limitations that it was a convenient sample. Great. And then we'd like to encourage other people in the audience to send in questions or um, share their stories that I can we can then discuss. Uh, we'd like other people to um, understand how this is used and what we can do. Um, your research has, oh, I'm sorry, I have a, a crazy cat. <laughs> Your research has been consumer driven uh, with a lot of this and looking at those using telehealth and how things are changing in response to the pandemic. So Nick, I'd like to go back to you again for a moment. And in preparing for this webinar, um, 
you mentioned that you see telemedicine as something that should be consumer driven. Uh, I'm just going to quote you for a moment. Something that struck me while we were talking. You said that if we quote, empower patients, they'll engage with their healthcare more. Can you explain a little bit about what you mean by that, about empowering your patients and why it's even important? Sure. So, you know, I think it, it's been happening in terms of, you know, some mandates from government in terms of, you know, patient portals and different things like that. And, you know, that your health record is is your health record, not not necessarily the hospital systems and you should have access to that information. So I think that's been happening. But um, but I think what what, you know, I'm going to say, you know, digital health, just because I think it's you know, yes, you know, telehealth and video visits, but just the overall, um, you know, digital engagement in, in your healthcare. I think if you have more access and you have more availability to these different kind of things, um, you're it, you're just naturally, I think, going to engage with it more. If you're able to, um, you know, more conveniently see your provider, maybe you're not going to put it off quite as much as you used to when you had to find ch child care and drive across town and sit in a waiting room. And it was very much kind of on the on the health systems or on the provider's set of rules. And I think what we've seen in the rest of our life, of course, is, is consumers, you know, we, um, you know, we're kind of driving the process. You know, I, Amazon's such a great um, such a great example, right? Because what they've done is, you know, they've done everything possible to make it as easy as it can for us to give them money, basically, right? And they're going to do whatever it takes to break down the barriers, deliver stuff to our house, um, all super easy. And that's, it's just completely changed retail. And I think what digital health uh, continues to do is, uh, is kind of allows that. So if we're able to break down those barriers and, and take out the 30 minute drive and the 10 minute in the waiting room and the child care, whatever, I mean, take out all those barriers. I just think we're, we're naturally as, as people uh, more likely to, to, to make those appointments, keep those appointments um, and, e and even do uh, additional things if we can. Um, which brings me to actually a question I just got from James Seward, um, one of our audience members. He says, um, can I get a basic definition of telemedicine? Could you go both give us an idea of how what you consider telemedicine? It's, it's obviously not one thing. Um, Nick, since you have the floor, you want to start and then maybe Dr. Holt, you can give us what you're what you how you see it. Sure. So I'll preface this with this is a major issue in, in the industry. There is no one definition. Like, for example, in Kentucky, you know, we define telehealth as a direct um, real time audio video connection between a patient in one place and a provider in another place. Indiana, which I have another hospital in, um, defines telehealth as remote patient monitoring, actually. Um, and they use telemedicine as as the definition. So unfortunately, there's not a uh, complete convenient definition. Oftentimes when I talk in my organization, I really try to go with what, um, what's the technology we're using. So for example, if we're, do if we're talking about video, let's just call it video. And so that just makes it a little bit cleaner for me. So, um, but basically it's a real time audio video connection between a patient, between a patient located in one place and a provider located in another place, depending on your state state. Um, or if you're on Medicare, there's some uh, some other types of, you know, little intricacies in there, but essentially, essentially that's what most people mean when they're talking telehealth, te telemedicine, but unfortunately there's not a, um, no one has stood up and said, here's what we're going to call it for now on and, and kind of go from there. I'm, I've been trying, but not, not many people have listened to me yet. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually a huge um, discussion and people have sides on in the research world for people who have studied, who are studying um, telemedicine, telehealth. So I kind of use them interchangeably. Um, my one of the first things I heard was telemedicine is, is uh, telemedicine if it's being provided by a physician because they practice medicine, and telehealth is for everything else. Um, I just call it either or, um, and I think that telehealth is maybe more the inclusive or more umbrella um, definition. I personally do include um, like the mobile. Um, the M health aspect of it. I also think that the remote monitoring stuff, um, the VA at the VA, uh, the remote monitoring was done by a telehealth nurse. Um, so I kind of all include that in my, you know, very simplified definition as a way to connect to healthcare services through uh, internet using computer, tablet, or mobile phone, or one of those uh, remote devices. Um, speaking of the VA, and this wasn't one of my prepared questions, but just uh, what was some of your experience with veterans and this technology? Is it something that we could really use 
more of or reach some of our veterans in the country, kind of a population that's sometimes left behind? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, one of the reasons, right, that telemedicine first started was to hit these rural areas. I, in Michigan, we have, you know, the North, probably where you've done your surveys, um, if I'm remembering, uh, reading that correctly, um, if I'm remembering it correctly. Uh, so there's a lot of rural areas, and I think that the VA has been um, very good at getting some of these technologies out to our, uh, to our veterans, especially those with chronic care that need to be managed. So they would send, you know, these monitoring devices that was pretty easy for the, um, the families to use. A lot of the work that I did actually looked at the um, OEI, uh, OEI. EF, so the Operation Enduring Freedom and uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So at the time, those were a little bit younger vets, and they were more interested too in using, you know, apps and having mobile phones and using like the Fitbits. So I think that uh, they are, it is a good way to do it. Um, the VA has been doing it for years. Um, and so they've been fairly successful at it, and especially in Michigan, hitting those rural populations. And uh, Nick, I know when we talked, you guys, we talked a little bit about Fitbit and Fitness Pal and different things like that that you explored. But I, I do know that um, the FCC awarded uh, Baptist Health Hospital was one of um, programs, many programs across the country that got it, were awarded um, some monies to explore remote monitoring, that type of thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then after that, I have, a, I have a couple of questions I'd like to get to from our audience. Sure, yeah. So, you know, again, just during the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of barriers broken down and a lot of um, grants out there to try to expand, uh, expand these services. And so the FCC had about $200 million that they were awarding uh, to folks that were basically going to expand their telehealth, telehealth coverage. So, um, so yeah, many organizations were awarded, uh, awarded monies for this. So we were lucky enough to, to get some dollars as well. And so, um, and so what we'll do with, with, with that money is number one, obviously just from a health system perspective, um, the amount of expense and the financial impact of the pandemic is, it is crushing a lot of smaller hospitals. Luckily we're large enough and we have been prudent enough that, uh, we've been able to, to, ma to maintain ourselves, but but certainly we had to implement so many different things over the pandemic in terms of isolation rooms and um, standing up technologies to visit, you know, to have family and friends visit with, with the patient that that uh, due to visitor restrictions and different things like that. Remote patient monitoring comes in in terms of um, we were getting to the point what in, in terms of what if planning, right? What if we ran out of hospital beds and ventilators and those kind of things, and we had to discharge patients or go to surge uh, into, you know, surge planning five into field hospitals. Um, so we were looking at a variety of things. Luckily, we never got to the worst um, here in Kentucky, thank goodness, but but it did allow us to really um, offset some of those expenses we already took on. And it also is gonna allow us to kind of look at a couple of additional things here. Um, just to uh, just increase our peripherals or, or some different things to enhance the clinical experience as it relates to uh, as it relates to video visits. So yeah, we were very lucky. Um, that kind of leads into a question um, that one of our audience members, Casey Kelly, has asked. Uh, can you please just? I'm just going to read your questions because it's pretty. It's a, a pretty succinct question. Can you please describe any existing federal or state level policies that serve as barriers and or facilitators for? telehealth and increasing access to care for more consumers. Yeah, so it's it's a different world right now. So pre-COVID, there was a lot of barriers and it was not consistent. Depending on your state, um, it could have been any number of things in terms of, you know, full uh, payment parity to coverage parity to a variety of different things in terms of, you know, your Medicaid, you know, your state uh, state funded Medicaid plans versus private insurers, which, you know, could kind of do do their own thing, of course. Um, and then you had uh, Medicare, which of course is federally funded, and they had their own restrictions. And so just really quick, so pre-COVID, there were a lot of barriers. Barriers. So for example, for Medicare patients, you had to, you couldn't be located at home, except for a, except for a very small, like behavioral health su substance abuse thing. You had to be located in a rural health census tract. So that kind of, you know, any, um, if you're in a urban area of any type, you were not eligible. You couldn't, you had to be at an eligible, um, 
eligible location. So you have to be at a hospital or a clinic, and then your provider could essentially be anywhere except for a rural health clinic. So there's a variety of things. And, and frankly, that's why the adoption was really low. Yeah, there was mm -hmm. some, um, some payment there, but frankly, to jump through the hoops and make sure that you're not breaking the rules or anything, um, really, really limited. And so if the reimbursement wasn't there and you're gonna invest in all this type of technology, it was really hard for a health system to take on. Now, during the pandemic, and again, I'll give great, I'll give great credit to a variety of, of, of people, but it was, it was just broken down. Every, every week, it felt like um, during, you know, March and April, there was another waiver put out. You know, early on, it was, okay, you can be located anywhere at this point. Then the next step was, okay, you, we, won't, we won't be checking your HIPAA requirements and security status. So, so again, for, you know, a large health system like us, we can take on the, the HIPAA secure license, you know, through Epic and through Zoom. But um, for other smaller practices, they, that, that was a big deal for them. So the fact that they could go through FaceTime, you know, on their iPhone or, or Google Hangouts, different things like that. So that really increased access. Um, there were other things in terms of new patients versus existing patients. There was that barrier. That, that was a waiver as well. So and now as we're coming out, there is legislation and there's certainly a lot of um, a lot of momentum on both sides of the aisle in, in Washington to say, yeah, this 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 needs to be pushed through. And even, um, you know, SEMA with CMS has said her quote has been the genie's out of the bottle. You know, we're, we're not going to be able to put these things back. So much like, you know, many of us are working from home and telecommuting and all those different kind of things. Um, much of uh, life and especially this is is forever change, you know, and why, why would the patient at this point be, you know, oh, wait a minute, I, I, I used to be able to do that. And that was so convenient. It was great. And now we're, you know, now I'm going to have to go back into the office and take on that inconvenience again. So, um, so pre pandemic, there were a lot of barriers and frankly made it very difficult. Each state was different. Federally was different, all those kind of things. We've reached to a point now where, I mean, frankly, at right this second, it's just wide open. It's, it, it's getting reimbursed. It's getting paid. Some payers are even weighing cost sharing, um, you know, as well, like, you know, Anthem, I know is one that's waiving cost sharing on telehealth. So there's just a variety of openness right now. And now it's a matter of, um, collecting data and being able to show the payers and show the government as we're going to have so much data finally now we're going to be, we're going to be able to prove and see how useful this is how clinically um, how much quality there is in it um, but luckily there's a lot of momentum on both sides of the aisle right now where I expect to a lot of these things to be permanent in the future yeah and just a uh, 100% with everything that Nick said and I was on another webinar with a lobbyist and she was saying that there are um, Congress people um, who are <laughs> against it um, before and it's like exactly what Nick said we can't go back like mm -hmm. I was against it before and now I see what it really is and there's no way to stop this it would really be hard to argue at this point that it has not been helpful given the circumstances we all find ourselves in that are, are very challenging um, I know uh, one of our audience members who's attending today, her name's Anne, she actually sent me some questions in advance um, because she was very excited to hear more about this and to learn more. And um, some of her questions were very basic in, in the sense that it was, you know, can I use my own doctor? Uh, will insurance cover this? Um, am I hearing from you both that some of that, those fears are being um, uh, lifted or are those concerns being lifted because of these regulations being changed? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, again, I, I can't say your particular doctor is gonna offer the service or not. Everyone's gonna have to kind of make that decision themselves. I would say overall, um, just like the folks in Congress that were against it now kind of see the, see the validity in it, many providers have been pushed into this uncomfortable, you know, we, we were closed. Unless it was an emergency, you could not come in for a healthcare visit unless it was done via video. And so yeah. providers, if they wanted to see their patients, they had to do it this way. And so they were pushed into this uncomfortable place where maybe they wouldn't have gone before. And certainly, yeah, we're able to see that there's definitely a use case. So I think just overall providers um, have been pushed in that place, whether everyone has or not, I'm sure not. Um, and in terms of insurance, you know, I think that's where the definition is, is, is important because um, like, for example, remote patient monitoring um, was actually very clearly covered by CMS 
but it's not very clearly covered in 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 private payers um not almost not covered at all um they were maybe a little bit more ahead for video visits i know a lot of big payers for example had their own virtual urgent care service you know anthem has their own humana has their own um so again that's the only the good thing from this though is there is some consistency now in terms of people are covering it people are offering it um it's certainly the barriers that were there um, for a practice to be able to provide this service, every possible barrier that was there is not there right this second. So the, I think the challenge though is for, like for example, the HIPAA secure requirement for a video platform. That, that's gonna come back. And I, I fully expect that to come back. So the folks that had a video strategy beforehand, um, you know, just kind of moved all along with it, kept that strategy. The folks that didn't really have a strategy beforehand and just quickly stood up FaceTime or Google Hangouts or whatever it may be was great, but they do need to begin to pivot to say, okay, what's going to be our long-term strategy and long-term platform so they can continue to offer the service. But, but certainly overall, the barriers um, that were there are, are certainly coming down I, and, and do expect many of them to remain that way. And Dr. Holtz, in your research, did you find anything from um, the people you spoke with that were concerned about some of those types of things like security or even, um, you know, will my insurance pay for this? Was that some of their um, fears about leveraging telehealth? Did you hear of any of that? So there is some concern always, I think, um, that will my insurance pay for this? I think that for the new users, they weren't worried uh, because of all this that happened right now, like your insurance is going to cover this. You don't have to worry about it. Like, so that wasn't um, as big of a concern. Um, I'd have to look at more. I mean, I, I just got this data and it's a lot. So I haven't looked at, through it all. So I'd have to look at the non-users and see if that was a concern. For the people who had used telemedicine, again, just speaking of the people who had experience with telemedicine, they weren't um, that nervous about privacy. Uh, and it could be a couple of reasons that one, um, they just assume, right, that their doctor, their um, health system have taken care of it and they don't have to be worried about it. But then even looking in the past, um, people haven't been necessarily as concerned as I think a lot of us think that they would be. Because if you're receiving care when you need it, how you can receive it, um, that's probably not your top concern. I think going forward um, and people think about it, oh, you know, maybe I should be concerned about this. Maybe I need to verify that, you know, my doctor is HIPAA protected and stuff. But I think the first thought that people have is like, oh good, I'm getting care. <laughs> and then all the other concerns afterwards. But in my experience um, from research and not just the study is that privacy doesn't tend to be the first concern. And I think that's expected in a health and medical, you know, if you're sick, you wanna be better. Yeah, and people, so people are assuming that their doctor's office are protecting, their doctor's offices are protecting their, their That's private. That's my insurance. assumption that is not from, that's just kind of my educated guess. Gotcha. Um, okay, so well, let's look a little bit, let's shift a little bit and look toward the future. Um, uh, Nick and I, when we spoke before previously about this, uh, we talked about, you talked about how there was a, a five-year plan that was suddenly becoming a six-month plan. And that right now, uh, Wall Street is really investing in telehealth. Everybody's looking for the what's the next innovation to leapfrog everything else. What are you seeing? And you both can share your thoughts on this. What do you, what do you see are some of the the future of telehealth? Things that we should all be on look for and and watch for, or even some obstacles that we should be aware of. Sure. Yeah. So very much. I think as I talk to other colleagues around around the country, it's um, basically a five year shift is things advanced in about six months, five, five years forward. Um, and that's really good. Um, of course, you jump five years and six months that that does come with some issues as well. So I think first and foremost, we all need to, you know, so like, for example, pre pandemic, we were doing about 50 video visits a week during the peak during an April, we were doing about 8000. We're now doing about 2,000, which again, nothing, 
anything bad of any type. 2000 is, is fantastic. But um, so we stood up so many different projects. We took on six to nine month project. We did one over the weekend of, you know, we just basically worked 14 hours a day and, and stood this up. So first and foremost, we need to go back and we need to optimize all these things. Um, this needs to be a really clean and seamless process for patients. Right now, you know, depending on your system, there could be some extra things that they need to do. They might have to download a couple different apps or, you know, do some extra work. It, re it really, again, needs to be seamless for the patient and, of course, as the provider as well. Um, there's certainly lots of technology things out there that are constantly improving in terms of, you know, the security, the audio video connections, all these different kind of things are really coming out there as well. So I think overall, we're going to have just kind of this look back of six to 12 months of, okay, we did all this work. Now, how do we make it a little bit better? So I, th I think that that's first and foremost. Um, then the next piece, I think, is how do we how do we add clinical tools? So if we're, if we're bringing, you know, I think a lot of people have heard the hospital at home, you know, concept now, and, and we had to during COVID for a variety of reasons, but you know, now, so, so bringing medical care at home, how do we take that to the next level? So it's great that I can see you via video as, as a clinician, and certainly we can position the camera, you know, in certain ways to find different things. But now from a peripheral perspective, you know, can I, can I get some heart and lung sounds? Right? Can I can I get into your ear with an otoscope? Can I can I really get some good pictures into into your throat? And and that is out there. And I think that's where we see um, some great companies really doing some incredible things to advance that process as well. So I think um, so. How do we bring that at home? How do we bring testing and diagnostics um, to home as well? You know, I I heard um, you know like COVID testing for example. You know, even like you know literally drive through clinics. You know, almost like a Jiffy Lube. And um, okay. Hey, that's that, that that could be convenient. I'm, uh, you know, that's interesting. But but how do we take that? How do we bring that test at home? How do we so how do we take those things at home? So if we're gonna if we're gonna have you at home for um, convenience and safety and all those kind of things, how do we take that next level of peripherals and testing? And I think that's really the, you know, the the example I've been giving is you know in, in 1900, you know, if someone said you know hey. Um, what, what's going to be the best way to, to, what's the best thing to, to get around with? And someone's, you know, most people would say, well, just give me a faster horse. You know, what's, just give me a really fast horse. Uh, it took a little while for someone to just conceive, oh, the automobile, that's, that's where we are. So that's where I think a lot of people are, we need to be thinking of is, is, is not just, you know, this kind of interim solutions, but but innovation, you know, really where is this next jump? And, and luckily that they're, that there's a lot of money getting invested right now. You know, Wall Street's in a tough place, but there's a lot of money getting invested with some really smart, innovative people because they're they're all we're all focused kind of on this one thing right now. Which it's incredible if if everyone's rowing in the same direction, even if they don't know it, um, the amount of innovation and uh, exciting things that could come from it. Yeah, just like to um, leapfrog again off of what Nick said, and I have some engineering friends and. They've been working, it's so interesting. So they've been working in rural areas of developing countries, giving like healthcare providers a cell phone that have attachments. So you can do like TV testing and you can do all of these other testing out in the fields. And so most people, not everybody, but most people have a phone. If you can connect something to that and get these diagnostic tests um, at home, I think that's a really interesting um, kind of way to, to think about, you know, I mean, my sample, again, li limitation, <laughs> convenient sample, but most people had the three to four devices. So if we can find these auxiliary things to connect, I mean, there are already scales, there are already, um, you know, uh, blood pressures that can be taken at home and sent um, directly. Another thing that I was thinking about was um, one of the big uses in my study was mental health care. But some people, you know, are feeling uncomfortable in this kind of um, way to do it. And so I'm wondering, thinking that AI, um, I'm sorry, augmented reality, AR, uh, virtual reality would have um, some application, some application in there. And then I really um, do think it's going to be about, right, this patient centered business that we're doing. If the patient wants to do this at home and do this this way um, and it's better for them and it, you know, they don't have to take work time off of work if they can, or they, they can just um, do these visits much quicker, um, that that could be 
a really interesting um, future shift in thinking about the patient centeredness of, of healthcare. There definitely is a cost incentive, I would think, for a lot of people, whether it's childcare, or taking off from work, or um, you know anything, because it takes time to go to the doctor and sit in the lobby and wait for all that stuff. So I can definitely see a cost um, portion of this, which I believe our Connected Nation Michigan study did do some of that research on. Um, I do have another question, which kind of related to what we were just talking about. Um, what are the, this comes from Grant, what are the trends in technology access use by users specifically related to landline, fiber connection versus mobile wireless use? Um, what, what are you all seeing? Do you have some thoughts on that or any kind of trends that you're seeing in that area? Yeah, so for our, for our visits, the majority are, are happening via mobile. Um, you know, I think uh, number one, just the uh, the breadth of that uh, of that connection is is generally a little bit more. Um, you know, we we certainly have some rural rural areas and things like that, and the, and the connection is and the internet connection in particular is poor. Um, I think if you look at the mobile phone as well, there is a little bit more control in there as well. If you look at some of these applications that are happening, like for example, um, you know, Epic and Zoom and MyChart and all these different kind of things, you know, just having it contained within an app and, you know, having your camera and your microphone built right into the device versus having a webcam and a wet and a speaker, all those kind of things. So I think if you look at it from a hardware perspective in particular as well, um, it's a little bit it's a little bit easier. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner. There's not quite as many things that could go wrong, you know, especially if you're looking at web browsers are a big issue um, as it relates to, to video connections and integrations. You know, I think everyone still has Internet Explorer. Some or you know, some companies still require it, um, but uh, everyone else is going to Chrome. And so there's some differences there. So I think from a hardware per perspective as well, that's where we're seeing a big shift to mobile. Um, I think certainly, you know, with, with 5G, you know, coming in the improvements there from a mobile perspective, I think we'll c continue to see that grow. Um, so I think overall, it, we, we, we are seeing more uh, push, push on the mobile side, at least from our perspective. I think that most people do have a mobile phone. And so I think, you know, if that's the device that they have that connects to the internet, that that's how they'll see their healthcare provider, if that's the only way that they have, which kind of gets me, um, thinking about, you, I think you brought it up a little bit, but these barriers, because um, he, he mentions um, fiber. I mean, I'm working with rural populations and they, there is just no fiber, there's nothing, you know? So this is, again, kind of separating the, the people who have these connections and they who don't in, you know, in so many different ways in thinking about that it's also impacting their healthcare as well. Yes, that is one of the reasons that um, Connected Nation Michigan and Connected Nation are hosting these telehealth webinars because we are very involved in the at the intersection of connectivity and um, improvement of quality of life. Um, and telehealth has just emerged in this big way, obviously, as we're talking about it. Um, there was already discussion, but that we did our, our, our local study in Michigan right before the pandemic. It was released February <laughs> of this year. So right before the closures began. So, um, but yes, we are, we work in a lot of rural areas and trying to help people get connected. And as you said, fiber is not necessarily the only solution, only it can be expensive. So sometimes it can be challenging. Um, so we have been really focused on advocacy and helping to get connection. And this is one of the reasons because telehealth is important and a lot of rural areas, you see a lot of hospitals closing. And so it would be nice to be able to get to a Baptist health, even if you live 200 miles away or to, um, have that access to help your, um, senior father who can't really leave. Um, so yeah, this is one of the reasons that we felt this was so important to talk about and help people to create some understanding. Um, is because of the need for access to it. Well, um, we've had a really great discussion, but I'd like to give you both the opportunity to talk about what you'd really like patients and providers to take away from today's uh, discussion and anything you'd want to add that we didn't touch on, perhaps? Yeah, I just had a, a question for, for Nick, yeah. actually, okay. and, and what you're doing, have you... Um, have you had any problems with patients and their tech literacy um, and getting, I mean, is there, is there groups of people? I mean, have you, 
how do you deal with that? Because I think that people want to see their doctor this way, but you know, maybe don't feel comfortable in navigating the technology. So how have you guys dealt with that? Yeah, so I'd say early on, honestly, we put a little bit too much on our patient. Um, you know, I think we were uh, asking them to do a little bit, a little bit too much in terms of the navigation and things like that. And so what I will say is, so pre-pandemic, a strategy would have been very different. We would have been kind of cherry picking patients to a certain extent and cherry picking providers, you know, um, you know, just let's go stereotypes, you know, give me the, the 35 new, you know, year old new doctor who loves EHRs, love technologies. Here's a patient that, you know, for us already has FX my chart or has a mobile phone, you know, is, is already using it in terms of, uh, you know, connecting with their provider has a clear, you know, good clinical use case. Then the pandemic hit and it, that's not good enough. It had to be used for everybody. And so we really, so again, this is where we put out a whole bunch of stuff and then we had to pull back and say, okay, here's just things we would have never even thought about if we worded something this way and we had to change it. And so we provided a bunch of consumer facing materials, you know, step-by-step -step walkthroughs of, you know, here's exactly what you need to click and then do this. Um, then we did some videos and the same thing. Again, walk through, click this, then click this. Then it's like, okay, how do we do that proactively now? And so then we started working on some things. Okay, as soon as you schedule your video visit, here are some materials, here are some links. And then the next phase now is we've actually um, are getting ready to integrate next week a whole standalone. Um, and again, for us, our video platform is through MyChart, um, is a whole MyChart help desk. So it's a, literally a third party that's going to be available 24-7 to help our patients connect. And so, for example, if you call our uh, patient connection hub and schedule a video visit, now our patient connection hub will be able to say, okay, uh, Brie, I see that this is your first video visit. Do you, are you comfortable? Do you, do you think you need any help setting it up? And you say, oh, yes, of course. Then we can transfer you. So instead of putting that burden on our providers and our front office folks that we already ask way too much of, you know, now we can kind of send them to this MyChart help desk and say, and now, okay, let's see, you've got your microphone enabled, you've got your camera enabled. Okay, great. Here's you. So the day of appointment, here's where you go. And so we've really, we've really, again, I think if we would have done it in a normal way, like, you know, a nine month, you know, integration plan and testing and pilots, we would have probably figured that out. But this is one of those where we've had to kind of on the fly, go back and find all these different opportunities for improvement. Because I think full transparency early on, I think we were asking too much of our patients. And now, um, it, it's getting better. Of course, patients are on their second and third video visit at this point. So even that type of literacy is becoming more and more. Um, but I think overall patient education um, is something we, you know, overlooked, didn't have time to do in the first place. And now we have so much out there um, and so many different avenues to get it to them. Oh, that's great. Um, let me, let me ask you, Nick, since um, Brie brought that patient education up a little bit, are health systems talking to each other at all? Or is that something that is very internal within your health system and say another group is doing something maybe a little differently? Are you guys sharing best practices at all? Or is it a competitive thing? Yeah, so, you know, I think within our particular market, it's certainly a very competitive, a very competitive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but there are some you know, so like, again, we're, we're an Epic shop, so Epic's our EHR. So we have a lot of great resources through them that we're able to, you know, chat with all sorts of Epic users and members from all over, from all over the world, really, on, on what they're using, if they're running into issues, problem solving, all those kind of things. So I think, you know, across the country, we were all in the same place. It didn't really matter how far ahead your, your video visit strategy was you were struggling at the peak of this pandemic. So if it was zero or a thousand, it really was a struggle. So we were all in the same position. Um, and so certainly nationally, we were talking a lot, trying to find best practices, um, evaluating companies together, evaluating vendors together, all those kind of things. But um, probably locally, we're, we're still a little bit too competitive to talk nicely, at, at least. Gotcha. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, let's let's again let's let's step into some final thoughts. Um, Bree, what are some things that you would like um, patients and providers to take away from this discussion today? I think that for patients, right, there is a choice um, in that you can ask. I think one of the um, uh, pan or uh, attendees asked about this, like, does my healthcare provider, you know, provide it? And I think that there is. Um, you know, to ask and to, to get this choice in senior healthcare providers. Sometimes I know that they can't see everything, you know, virtually that you do have to go in, but some things like med uh, reconciliations or just like 
quick checkups to make sure everything's going fine. I think those are things that can definitely be done online for PCPs, uh, for primary care providers or other healthcare providers. Um, just, you know, I think Nick's shop has a great, it sounds great for both the providers and the, the patients, but just to continue that training um, with communication. So I know that sometimes, I don't know if you guys had this experience with the EMR in a, in a room that wasn't set up for that, right? So if you're the, the camera's the patient, right? They would turn and type. And I'm like, that's not good. That's not good health <laughs> communication. Um, you have to look at your patient and, and type. And I think they've gotten quite good at that. But now it's just simple things like make sure you look up at the camera because that really makes sure, like, I can't see you guys, but I think it shows that I'm looking at you. And mm -hmm. training providers, like, uh, with those kind of just small communication things, um, and again, I think people are satisfied. It sounds to me, Nick, that some of the providers seem to be somewhat satisfied using this. Um, but I don't think that right telemedicine is going to be the panacea. We are still going to go to see our healthcare provider uh, in person. I think that that touch is still important, especially in diagnostics. You know, you can't feel any sort of like lumps or, or any skin thing without that touch. Um, so life care is still important. And while I'm a huge advocate of telehealth and telemedicine, I understand that. Um, but I do think that telemedicine brings um, more complete care. It can bring access to care. Um, people might be willing to get more care to prevent problems later. And I do think it's part of the, um, really the patient-centered medical home in providing that choice to the patient. And Nick, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, so I, I think we're, it's gonna be exciting the next couple of years to really see the, the innovation um, in the tools that are out there because it, it's, again, we're all kind of rowing in the same direction right now. Um, I, I would say, absolutely, this, this does not replace in-person visits or, or that need. We're, we're not trying to re replace that, that relationship or anything like that. Um, but, and that will always, that'll always be there. So, you know, but, but digital health and telehealth are, are going to have a purpose. Um, I think in three or four years, uh, maybe less at this point, we won't be focused so much on the definition of telehealth, digital health. We're just going to call it healthcare. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's just an avenue. It's just going to be an avenue to do it. So I think there's lots of innovation to come. Um, I think the more we can get our patients connected with their healthcare at home, the better, as opposed to just thinking about it every six months or every 12 months for a physical. If we can keep them connected and engaged with their healthcare through digital tools, like, I mean, heck, Facebook, right? I mean, we, we connect with our friends and family all the time, even though we never see them and maybe we don't even want to, but, um, but we're at least connected with them. So same thing with our healthcare providers, all these tools now, we can be connected with our health, connected with our health system, um, and we can do it more than just that, that one time a year, which it's supposed to be one time a year, but we put it off every six months anyway, so it ends up being every two years. I'm not talking about myself by any stretch, uh, <laughs> but it does, it does happen. So I think lots of innovation to come. Um, it's really gonna be exciting. And I think um, yeah, I think everyone is going to have to adopt and the barriers that were there um, for whatever reason from from government and payers, uh, those are going to go away as well. So I think I think we're really exciting time um, and uh, look forward to the next uh, in the next couple of years for sure. Well, I want to thank you both for sharing your thoughts and your expertise with us today. Um, I know for some people it's a new space to navigate. Um, or they're just looking to find out what the next innovations are. So I really appreciate you both joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our, our guests today, again, were Nick Sarantis, who is the System Director of Digital Health for Baptist Health, which is located in Louisville, Kentucky area, and Dr. Bree Holtz, who is the Director of the Health and Risk Communication Master's Program at Michigan State University. And on the topic of regulation and policy, you'll want to join us for our next webinar, which is on Tuesday, September 22nd. During that webinar, we will talk with Ryan Palmer, who is, the, who is the Division Chief for the Telecommunications Access Policy Division within the Federal Communications Commission. The FCC does a lot when it comes to telehealth. They have a lot of say in um, regulation and policy in this area. Ryan's division specifically has principal oversight responsibility for all aspe aspects of universal service policy 
issues, including the COVID-19 telehealth program. So we'll get a big update from him. Um, that'll be September 22nd. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. We hope to see you at the September webinar.